This program, of course, is presented by Pro Wrestling Illustrated, the most widely read, widely sold, and respected wrestling magazine in the world today. This is a Pro Wrestling Illustrated podcast. I am your host, QWI senior writer, Al Castle, with two co-hosts. Uh, firstly, as always, uh, Brian Solomon back once again. How are you? That's right. I'm doing okay. I hope I hope you're doing well also. Absolutely. And for this, which is the 200th episode of the PWA podcast, I thought it would be fun to bring back uh, my original co-host, former PWI senior writer, Dan Murphy. How are you, Dan? I'm out of the crypt. I'm back. I'm happy to be <laughs> here, man. 200 episodes. Who would have thought that the PWI podcast would have, uh, well, we started this thing years ago, that uh, that we'd be here. You know, it's uh, we put this together on a wing and a prayer, and uh, 200 episodes later, it's still going strong. I'll, I'll get back into it here, but but in, in case I do choose to edit the, all, all that out, we had to uh, uh, stop there for a moment because we had technical difficulties. And as Dan just pointed out, that's sort of perfect because, Dan, if you remember the early days of, of the PWI podcast, this is like all there was, was was complications. And um, the, for my, my old MacBook, which I started this on, this was back in 2015, I think I had to have something like four different programs running to be able to to uh, record us, and the the earliest uh, interviews that I ran, I actually recorded on like a cassette, and I and I re- don't even remember what the connection, but I had to run something connecting my my MacBook and like my boombox. Yeah, I, I remember going through entire episodes, and at the very end, after the sign off, there was hold on, let's see if this was a uh, recording. <laughs> Oh, hold on. Uh, it was. Okay, good. We're good. There we're, were some we're... of those, yes. And and the, the audio quality varied wildly, and uh, but but it was fun. And yeah, I mean, years before we, we even uh, started, I was asking Stu uh, to do this. So I can't believe podcasts have even been around that long, because I think our first episode was uh, 2015. I actually looked it up uh, today. It, it exists on YouTube somewhere. And, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, the irony of that, Dan, you know what we talked about on that first episode? Was it Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar? Uh, I think it was. It was definitely Brock Lesnar. 2015, <laughs> I think it was Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, yes. Same as it ever was. <laughs> yes, yeah, some things never change. But it's been great, 200 episodes in. I would certainly encourage you, if, you, if you've only been listening for a short time, um, go back into the archives. I don't think we've got every episode archived, unfortunately. I mean, I think they exist somewhere. But, um, you know, you talk about uh, and on top of obviously all the great conversation we've had here, uh, we've we've interviewed really a who's who from Shawn Michaels to Steve Austin to uh, gosh, who we had the Miz, um, John Moxley and, and on and on. I mean, really, uh, some of the biggest names in the sport. It's been uh, fun and, and obviously uh, great names from the history uh, of this magazine. We've obviously had Stu. Uh, on and we've had Craig Peters on and Bill after and uh, so many over the years and and that's one thing I always wanted to do with this podcast and I want to get get back into doing it and I guess I'm sort of doing it now aren't I with uh, Dan here I'm I'm glad to be a little uh step backwards in the history I suppose (laughs) you're you're an officially uh, an old timer now (laughs) that's a grizzled grizzled vet thank you (laughs) yeah so so before we 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 we, uh uh, jump into other things Dan what have you been up to what's it been now it's been two years three years Three years. Uh, stepped away in 2019, right after the Women's 100. Um, and uh, yeah, basically now I just kind of sit around and yell at the kids to stay off my lawn. You know, <laughs> I sh- shake my fist at the neighbors, you know, stuff like that. Uh, no, uh, you know, just uh, kind of doing family stuff and, uh, you know, just hanging out with the dogs, doing some other writing. Um, still watching wrestling. Not, well, not often, not often, but I, I've been a wrestling fan all my life, and I still follow it. So I'm still following everything that's happening, but I, I never get to the stage where I sit down and watch a wrestling uh, show for fun anymore. You know that that those days are kind of gone. But I'm still following everything that's happening in the news, and you know all the current events, and obviously the history, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, reading Brian's book uh, that's been on the to-do list for a little bit. Uh, but the history is, is what I love the most, and, and the old stories of wrestling, and that passion will never go away. And, and remind people how long you were with the magazine. 
Oh, 22 years. Wow. Uh, from uh, 97 to 2019. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And it had a book that came out myself. And uh, last year, which which kind of sucked, having a book come yeah. out during COVID, you know, uh, you know, just no uh, no signings, no promotion. When I did uh, uh, the book with Pat LaProd, The Sisterhood of the Squared Circle on, on women's wrestling in 2017, uh, we, it came out WrestleMania weekend or the week before. So down in Orlando for WrestleMania doing all the shows, he was at one venue selling books. I was at another, um, I mean, just such a synergy and so many events and, and so much excitement, uh, you know, and, and give, being able to find Wendy Richter and Medusa Maselli and all these women who would pose with the book. And then, you know, fast forward just two years, uh, another, or no, three, four years, four years, uh, fast forward four years during COVID and a book comes out about, uh, the wrestlers, wrestlers, the masters of the craft of pro wrestling. And there's just no events. There's nothing happening. Yeah. You can't do anything to promote it. So, uh, a little bit different, but, uh, still staying involved through things like that. Well, we're promote away. What, what again is the name of the book and, and where do people get it? It is, uh, the wrestlers, wrestlers, the masters of the craft of professional wrestling, basically talked to a bunch of wrestlers and looked at the idea of who are the guys you like to work with and why, like what makes a, you know, an actor's actors, the actor that all the other actors want to emulate a wrestler's wrestler is the one all the other wrestlers look at is, is the true masters of the craft and just talk to a bunch of different wrestlers about who the guys were that they think were really the, the top of the na- the, the game. And, uh, it was really cool. Got a lot of old stories, uh, young guys, old guys, obscure guys, famous guys, good cross section of talent talking to us. Uh, my co-author Brian Young and I, and, uh, it was a real a lot of fun, a ton of fun to put together. Just so, a shame that it came out during a pandemic. Yeah. So this is, this is both, uh, current wrestlers and, and wrestlers from the past, as far as who these wrestlers wrestlers are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like guys like Daniel Bryan and William Regal and, and things like you that. You have been gone a long time. Now it's Brian Danielson again. Well, Brian Danielson, <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's been a while. Showing my age. <laughs> yeah. Back when I was a boy, he was an American <laughs> dragon. I think he's that again. I'm not sure. I lose track. Uh, anyway, is. It, it is great to have you uh, back on. Uh, Dan, uh, look at me uh, surrounded by two uh, brilliant wrestling minds and authors. I feel very much like the uh, the underachiever here. I just opened you, a, a free blockbuster you, outside my house. You, that's what I was going to say. You got a blockbuster <laughs> going on. That is you amazing. resurrected VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, I just checked that out. Now we got some some more tapes in there. That's but fantastic. Uh, when, when we were planning this, Brian made a joke about it. This being like, uh, was it my my ex wife meeting my new wife? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we did say something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, uh, again, it really is awesome. I'm, I've been uh, lucky enough to have two uh, awesome co-hosts here in the uh, the seven years that we've been. I guess in seven years we've been uh, at this, uh, and and both times much more uh, uh, capable, knowledgeable uh, than I am at this. So uh, very much, and and I have like sat under uh, the learning tree of you both, and uh, am the the better wrestling fan and and writer for it. So uh, thank you guys for the last seven years. And uh, here's to, I don't know how many more, I don't know if I'll say seven more, as many as, many as we're able to do. Um, and uh, again, we, we took a few weeks off in part because we were trying to put this uh, together and there were some scheduling issues. And uh, in the meantime, goodness gracious, all, all hell's broken loose, <laughs> it seems. I mean, so many uh, big stories. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of them. I don't even want to preview too much because I'm not sure what we'll be able to get to. But for sure, we're going to be talking about uh, Vince McMahon stepping down as chairman of WWE. I mean, it, it feels odd even saying that. Um, and, and that said, I, I also I mean, we'll talk about this in a moment, but but maybe not as big a story as that sounds. And and as uh, uh, some of the mainstream media uh, w- would have you uh, think. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but right now, let me tell you about the latest issue of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Yes, Dan, we're still doing these plugs. <laughs> All these years later, uh, I got you got your uh, your your super cards issue, Brian. I did, yeah, I did. Yeah, so finally, yeah, there was a little issue for a while there with um, some delays, and I think we're all caught up now. Uh, yeah. I've got my August uh, super cards issue, uh, uh, another awesome issue uh, that. Uh, uh, did, did you have a hand in, in bringing back these uh, super cards, Brian? No, I mean I know anything that's old is <laughs> yeah. automatically like assume that. It's my it's my doing. No, um, uh, this that's all uh, Kevin. And in fact, and it's the, it 
it came back, I think, last year was the first time he yes. brought it back. Or maybe, right, no, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe he was trying to impress me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, yes, yeah, a throwback to uh, uh, the Supercards issues that were uh, a, a big staple of the magazines back in the 80s and, the and cover, 90s. Yes, the cover yeah, is like a such a, uh, I think it was the uh, a throwback to Supercards 86, right? The yeah. 1986 issue, I think. Uh, I mean, it was such a old fashioned cover. It looked, I mean, it, it was, I, I got it in the mail and uh, was, I popped for it right away. Uh, yeah. Even though I'm not a huge fan of the current product, just the design and the presentation brought me right back and pulled me right in. And as soon as I saw it, I couldn't help but pick it up and, and flip through the magazine. So I, kudos to the guys in the graphic arts department because uh, I thought it looked beautiful. Absolutely. And I think it's always kind of our sweet spot when we're able to, uh, a touch on that nostalgia and also incorporate uh, um, a lot of new stuff. And that's certainly the case with this magazine, Supercard uh, 22, I guess we're calling it. And uh, we uh, showcase some of the biggest shows uh, of the year uh, in wrestling. Obviously, we're talking WrestleMania 38, but also AEW Revolution, uh, the NWA Crockett Cup. We got shows from Stardom, from Ring of Honor. Um, New Japan, uh, ECWA, even the Super A tournament. We went to one of those once today, I remember. Um, a- and uh, all here in the magazine. Uh, go pick it up, pwi-online.com. Uh, and in addition to that, there's all kinds of fun features in here. This uh, this is the magazine, I guess, with my uh, Billy Corgan interview. Yeah, talk about uh, a throwback, which is a dirty word, um, according to uh, <laughs> Billy Corgan. And uh, so much more. So uh, go check it out. And one thing that I'm sure you don't miss, uh, Dan, but we're getting working now on the PWI uh, 500. And, uh, you know, little known fact, you you were in large part kind of like the caretaker of the 500 for uh, what, the last 10 years that you were at the magazine? Yeah, probably about 10 years. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Did a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, the again and we talked about it in the past on the podcast but we would we would do a ranking meeting and and rank as many as we could in a day as a committee and then uh Stu would have me kind of rank out the rest of the list and come back to the team and and then get some feedback from there and everything else so um yeah i i spent and what i tried to do i really this is what always kind of uh was was a personal thing for me um, I would try to take notes throughout the year on shows I was attending or TV shows I was watching on guys who I thought should be considered for the 500. So all year long, I had my own series of notes, plus everything was going on and plus people making r- recommendations or submissions and, and things like that. Um, I really tried to have a good cross section of people represented. And I think that Kevin, I'm not sure who's overseeing everything now, uh, in terms of a committee or one person, but I've been I've been watching the 500 and how it's evolved and changed. It's definitely very different. The yeah. criteria might have changed a little bit as well, um, but I think that one thing that has hold true, and, and maybe even more so, to to the, the credit of of the current regime, I guess, is the uh, the effort to be more diverse and more yes. inclusionary, and not just be people in the Northeast, people on the national feds and and whatever, but really kind of digging around and finding that talent and giving them an opportunity to shine in the 500, which is very cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Brian and I uh, sat in on uh, the first of two meetings, I guess, as we're recording this, we're we're meeting again tomorrow. I don't know if to finish off the list, but to kind of at least get through uh, a few more. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, different uh, people at the table now and uh, different perspectives. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that has been a, a signature of uh, Kevin since he came on is uh, a really striving to be more inclusive and uh, consider some factors that that maybe uh, didn't get as much consideration uh, before. And uh, yeah, w- while also sticking to the bread and butter um, of you know, the criteria of the 500 and what it takes to certainly make it to the very top. Uh, I think it's going to be a real interesting uh, list this year. We haven't started yet, and I am, you kind of look forward to it and also kind of half dread it because, um, you know, all the work that goes into it. The other thing that we're, we're getting working on uh, now, and, and I think you worked on this too, with the, the PWI poll, uh, Dan, and and uh, the, the PWI poll, like sort of low-key, is maybe harder to put together than, than the 500. I, I mean, I had a hand in it last year more than most years. 
And uh, yeah, it was a, a hell of a thing to to put together. And I had help, I think, last year from Chris and Ashley, and I think she's going to help out again um, this year. But yeah, we got some heavy lifting here to do in, in the next few weeks. Uh, so stay tuned. Go to pwi-online.com and check it all out. And uh, as I said, dig into uh, the archives of uh, the PWI podcast. Uh, you got 200 episodes to look back on. And uh, yeah, it kind of uh, tells the, the history of, of wrestling over the last, uh, whatever it's been, seven years. Blows my mind. All right, guys, let's, let's talk some current events. And I touched on it. I mean, stories in some respects don't get much bigger than this. And, and that is uh, a Vince McMahon. Uh, stepping down, I'll give you kind of the, the snapshot version. Wall Street Journal broke a story uh, last week about Vince McMahon paying $3 million in hush money to a former paralegal that he um, was having a sexual affair with. This is uh, the Wall Street Journal's uh, reporting. And uh, I guess at some point she left the company and uh, they, they agreed on these payments that totaled $3 million over uh, some time. Um, and uh, when the board of directors did it, got wind of that, they launched an investigation. Uh, it seems sort of preemptively trying to get uh, ahead of things. Uh, Vince McMahon made the decision to step down and uh, name Stephanie McMahon. I mean, this would have been a big story in and of itself. Stephanie McMahon, who who walked away from WWE uh, some weeks ago, now back as the interim chairperson, uh, at least uh, while this investigation is going on. Uh, Brian, I'll, I'll throw, throw to you just in terms of a big picture. I see it on CNN. I see it on MSNBC. As I mentioned, a Wall Street Journal breaking the news. How big a story is this? It, it's very big. And it's it's big because of the times that we're in. You know, I think uh, all of the WWE's notorious scandals of the past and Vince's biggest scandals, they took place, you know, in a different era, uh, an era of, and I'm not even just talking about in society, although that's important. I mean, even just an era in the company, you know, a, a privately held company, a mom and pop business in a very insulated industry. Uh, now you've got a publicly traded company on a higher level of visibility, really, than than you know than ever because of that. And you also have a, a culture that is rightfully far less tolerant of things like this. I mean, Vince McMahon is somebody who's existence has almost been an anomaly and a miracle this entire time in terms of like, thank goodness, nobody knows their history basically. Mm -hmm. But, but now it, you know, people I think had thought, okay, well that, that Vince is in the past. Now he's old man Vince and he's, you know, and he, you know, he, he still, he's still, um, you know, this, this ruthless business tycoon, but the guy that was getting mixed up in all these scandals and things that was, you know, from long ago. And now here we are with the revelation, because it's not apparently just this one person, because the investigation now is revealing a pattern of of these hush payments over years um, that, that, you know, he's up to his old tricks here and, and he's really the same kind of guy. And unfortunately, um, the problem is when even if he wasn't using company money, here's the thing. If he was using company money, then he, he may be going to jail for something like this. But but if he's not using company money and claiming like he says that it's his own money, you're still talking about a high level of impropriety from for as from the point of view of a board of directors. You know what I mean? A board of directors is looking at this stockholders looking at this, you know, stockholder meetings and things. This is, um, as the kids like to say, a bad look. This is <laughs> yeah. a situation where they're pro they're going to look to push him out. I have no doubt at all. Really? See, I, I am not as convinced. And and um, I think one of the, the interesting things about this story is that every once in a while, in, in there's a story that hits the mainstream media about pro wrestling that is sort of a reminder to uh, fans and, and writers, people like us, that this uh the, the the rest of the world doesn't view this the way we do and and uh the, the reality being that uh, i think especially people who were sort of you know i don't, I don't want to say in the know sort of like we're insiders but people who follow the wrestling business um it's fair to say we weren't all that surprised that something like this would be going on um knowing vince mcmahon's right. reputation for the last 40 plus years of of, of being uh in, in wrestling but seeing the way it was covered 
you're sort of like reminded like, oh, yeah, you guys don't know how this works. <laughs> right, and, that's true. Uh, and, and, and sort of a depressing way. And, and, and the idea being like, yeah, of course, this is going on. This is uh, a Vince McMahon. B- but also, um, I, I sort of feel like, you know, you touched on, on this being a bad look, Brian. And I think that that's all that the concern is here is sort of optics. And uh, I imagine that the the objective here is to sort of deal with the optics and then carry on business as usual, which is to say, I don't think Vince McMahon is done in, in WWE by, by any stretch, regardless of, of, you know, what it says on his paycheck or or whose name is is on the door of the of the chairperson's uh, office. Uh, Dan, do you agree? I mean, I, I, I it, my sense is. OK, I guess Stephanie takes on the, the official title as chair for as, as long as they they need to kind of uh, get away from this and, uh, um, you know, again, ad- address the optics. But uh, behind the scenes, Vince McMahon continues pulling the strings as much as ever is as, as involved in and as in charge uh, as ever. But with the cover that officially I stepped down. I don't know. Um, I, I, and I don't think so uh, because the thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with Vince, if you look at him, what are his strengths in 2022? H- his strength is not an on-air character. He's, he's obviously lost a few steps. He's gotten older. We all have, he's, he's not the Mr. McMahon from 1998, 1999, 2000. Uh, he, he that's not where he excels is on screen. He doesn't excel, even though he's running creative still. He doesn't excel in a creative. Like he's not bringing up a lot of fresh ideas. He's he he. he it's become kind of a trite thing to say. Old man McMahon is always you know tearing up scripts and and the show goes and it's rewritten and and not a lot comes out of it. Uh, his his real uh, strength is his business acumen and and managing the company and maintaining maximum dollar for stakeholders. And right now that's compromised because stakeholders in, in 2022, you can't be paying hush money for uh, affairs, especially whether or not it is out of the, the company coffers, which it may be or may not be. Um, but, but you can't be doing that. That's not something that a, a CEO should be doing. Um, and if you take away his strength, of management at that executive level, everything else he's not as good at as he used to be. Now there can be a role for him as an on-air character. There can be a role for him. He's certainly going to be part of WWE until until the very end for him. But uh, I, I don't think that it's a foregone conclusion that he's going to come out of this on top. I think it's entirely possible that he will be forced out of his uh, even the creative capacity and being reduced to an occasional on air character for some little kind of cameos or maybe a promo here and there. Uh, maybe not though. Maybe he'll be exonerated. Maybe, you know, after the investigation, his name will be cleared. Um, but like you said earlier, um, this was not a surprise to a lot of people. A lot of people in the, who follow the industry or cover it, we're not surprised that there were allegations made and it wouldn't surprise me to see as the investigation goes further and further that there's going to be a lot more dirt that comes out in the coming weeks. Yeah, that is interesting because again, I think we take for granted that, uh, you know, Vince McMahon is who he is. And when, when you think about, um, and Brian, we've, we've talked about this, uh, relatively recently, even when talking about this notion of, of, uh, a Tammy Sitch being removed from the hall of fame, because of of some of her legal issues and and talking about you know the the, the hornet's nest <laughs> that that you would be uh, digging up if if you, you started really examining um the the uh the personal lives of of people involved in wrestling especially from a past generation and you know when when you think of the 80s and the 90s and, and really how kind of dirty and seedy this business was and at the helm really sort of leading all that i mean as much as he was the most influential person in wrestling and is now was vince mcmahon i mean he 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 set that tone um for the 80s and 90s and uh look never convicted of anything so so they're just accusations but we know the stories right i mean um some i guess never really sort of graduated past just being rumor but 
uh, we've heard the stories of, of, of female referees and, and limousine rides mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and all kinds of stuff uh, over the years. And I, I think it's just among people who follow wrestling, you just know that this is the person who is running the company. For better or for worse, that's who this person is. And again, you take for granted, yeah, that, uh, yeah, it's not like this in most places. And, and the the chairman of a, a, a multi, multi-million dollar conglomerate like, like WWE, um, you know, paying hush money to to a paralegal that he was sleeping with, um, yeah, that 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 is enough in in most companies to to get you uh, sent packing. Again, I think both of you guys are a lot more. Um, I don't even know what the word is, but 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 I I, I uh, certainly am not ready to conclude by a long shot that that uh, much is going to change here. You know, I I, I think. Um, you know, they they get their PR team to do what PR teams do, and you have your investigation, and, right. um, you know, you, you go away for a little while, and then in investigation concluded that, you know, we found nothing, blah, 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 and sometime later, whether he ever has this title uh, or not, um, I just don't think that... It, and look, he was on SmackDown Friday night, and... and somewhat defiant right and and made it clear i i you know without saying very much i'm not going anywhere right Right. but there's a couple of very important factors here though that make this a little different and i think chief among them is the timing which could not have been possibly worse because you're talking about a company that is clearly to anybody with eyes and ears right being readied for sale in a big way Um, And then something like this happens. So that also gives leverage to the forces within the company, whether it be Nick Khan, board of directors, whatever it is to say, look, I don't care who you are. You're not screwing up this sale. This is not going to go down like this. And if you want to make a killing and sell this company, then you need to disappear. So that's part of it. I think another part of the sign of the seriousness of it. Is, uh, ha- is is partly the Stephanie situation, because I think something that a lot of people may be overlooking is that Stephanie is a member of the board of directors. And I don't think it's a coincidence that she decided to step down herself in April. And I, I, I think there's reason to believe that she knew about this mm. and that that was one of the reasons that she walked away, whether it be out of disgust or any other reason. Um, So, I mean, that that also shows you, you know, if true, how serious something like this is, especially it might have been a situation of, you know, maybe solidarity for her husband. That's possible as well. Or it could have been this. And you're also talking about an age factor. This is a 77 year old Vince McMahon. This is not a 37 year old Vince McMahon. So if he uh, steps away, well, how long is he going to step away for? Till he's 80. You know what I mean? Where he's at a point in his life where I think it's very conceivable that um, he is not coming back to that role at all. Um, it's almost like um, for 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 powers that are in motion, which they clearly are in motion in that company. This is almost like something that they were waiting for to try to get rid of him. Not that I'm a tin foil hat kind of a guy. But 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 I could see that as factoring into this. I mean, you talk about PR and PR teams getting together and coming up with a strategy. I think any PR team of a company like this worth their salt, the strategy they're going to come up with is you need to never be seen again. I mean, that's the PR strategy. You need to take a back seat and be invisible, even if you if you do have some type of a role. It can't be an official role because um, that's, you know, the optics are awful for something like that. So I think this is a different kind of situation is what I'm trying to say. And believe me, I'm one of those people that always says, you know, there obviously there's this is a very dirty business. And if you don't think it is, then you haven't really been following it. But, you know, there's a big difference between Tammy Sitch and Vince McMahon. You know what I mean? Right. By by right. the same token, though, Brian, um, and it may be the tinfoil hat thing, but you mentioned Stephanie. Maybe she got wind of this when she stepped down, or maybe she knew about this going on because, again, the allegations is that this has been an ongoing thing, and certainly she right. knows her father. But it really. But makes she me may. Wonder. But she may have known. She may have known that it was finally going to be coming out, and she wanted maybe wanted no part of that. You know what I mean? Exactly. I'm thinking maybe with Shane. Years ago, when Shane McMahon stepped aside as, as the heir apparent, 
you know, maybe it's a similar thing of Shane realizing, you know, there's some, some behavior here, some patterns here, some, some liability here that I don't know if I want to, you know, I, I want to branch out and do something else. I mean, it's, it's speculative, I'll admit, but it's entirely possible that the, the people closest to Vince may have seen thing, the writing on the wall ahead of time and maybe kind of diversified their options before, uh, you know, right. And, yeah. yeah, and and one thing, Al, if I could just add one thing to that too, which which strikes me, and this is from you know working closely with both of them, honestly, with all three of them, is he, this is also what is a li- what gives me a little pause here is you know the relationship between Vince and Shane has always been very contentious. It, it's always been adversarial, and and you know this kind of. Uh, you know, trying to prove myself to my daddy kind of thing. And that's me saying it. And I saw it with my own eyes. But having said that, the relationship between Vince and Stephanie was always golden. I mean, mm-hmm. she she is the or was or always was the apple of his eye. And I really mean that. I mean, like he just becomes the closest thing to a human being when he's around her. Like like he just, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, they're, and they're, you know, they're, they're, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I think he realizes that she's more like him than Shane is. You know, and there's always been a lot of simpatico between the two of them. And if there is kind of a rift happening here where she's finally saying, like, oh, my God, I, you know, are you kidding me? Like, uh, uh, you know, that's a serious thing. That's a relationship that's been unshakable as far as anybody can tell. And and if she even is fed up with him, um, that's a big deal, too. I, I don't have any reason to believe that. And maybe I'm wrong. But but if anything, I think what what we've learned almost indicates uh the opposite i mean if 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 there was um this rift and stephanie was disgusted with her father um for for his behavior here would she i guess you could see this different ways but to me stephanie stepping in speaks to um them still being aligned and and the idea that Stephanie can carry out Vince McMahon's uh, vision. It, it's essentially a way for Vince McMahon to stay in power without formally staying in power. Now, th- there is the other issue, as you touched on, that the, the, that might not be that arrangement might not be okay with board of directors who truly want Vince McMahon uh, gone. And and uh, in, in that sense, then I don't know if it makes sense to put Stephanie um, in in uh, this position. Uh, but but assuming it is what it appears to be. Uh, Dan, is this a, a turning of the page for WWE? I mean, it's something that we've talked about for so long, the day that Vince McMahon is, is not in power. And, and as uh, you, you touched on, I mean, he's, he is um, now almost 80 years old. And now with what is potentially a very serious uh, scandal. And um, there is now a, a power structure uh, in place, maybe more than in the past, where... Um, you know, it, it's not inconceivable that somebody else would be running this company, but whether it's Stephanie or uh, um, uh, Nick Khan or or so many of the other people who who you know that that's a product of of WWE maturing so much as, as a publicly traded company is that it, it's not the mom and pop you know wrestling shop uh, anymore. Uh, so. Uh, and again, so, so much of this is speculative because it's only days old. But but does this feel like again the turning of a page? I think it means. I, I think it feels like the 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 post McMahon, the post Vince McMahon era is imminent. Um, you know whether this takes him down or not. Uh, like you said, he's almost eighty years old, and he he's an almost 80 year old man who's had an incredible work ethic. He spent, you know, there's all these stories about how he he doesn't sleep often, how, how much time he spends on the road and how he attends shows and he's always working and nobody can kind of burn the candle at both ends for that long uh, because father time steps in, you know, and, and coming up at 80, that's, that's an incredible, most people are content, especially when they've got all the money that Vince has to enjoy some retirement and have uh, some quality of life rather than being, you know, going from arena to arena, rewriting shows. I mean, uh, Jesus, as much as I, I, if I were Vince, uh, as much as I'd love the business, I don't want to be doing that at 80 years old. Like I'd rather, you know, enjoy some of this money I've made and do something, you know, whatever. Um, So I, I think that whether this is what, what, 
gets him out the door or it's just finally, you know, the retirement, whatever the, the case may be. I think it, it's, it's really at that stage where a, a WWE without Vince McMahon at the helm seems imminent. And after all this time, no one still knows what that looks like there. You know, at one point it looks like it was Shane at one point it looked like it was triple H and Stephanie. And now with, with the corporate structure and everything else, who knows? And with a potential sale, it, it could be entirely different. So here we are at, at this stage of the game, and uh, we still don't know what the future of WWE necessarily looks like. And I think it's time that we really have to look and, and ask. Yeah, I, I don't buy for a moment that Vince would, would ever sort of willingly step down and, and retire and kind of enjoy the fruits of his labor. I mean, and I'm sure you if, know this as well gonna, as anyone. At some point, you've got to do it. I mean, you, you can't no. work yourself. <laughs> I, 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 I fully expect that if, if allowed to, and, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, he would do this until he dies, right? I think he would if given the choice, but I think, yeah, I, I do believe that. I mean, if he was going to step down willingly, he would have done it already by now. I think the only thing that could ever stop him would be if he was physically incapable. I mean, then even be... then, I'm not sure. I, I see him. <laughs> no, I mean, incapable of traveling, incapable of walking. I mean, like, you know, we've all seen the ravages of old age, and they're not, uh, not to be incredibly bleak, they're not a whole hell of a lot different down the road from where he's at right now that's sure. what i mean yeah yeah but but honestly even if he could uh, uh you know was in a situation where, where you're sort of describing where he was homebound and maybe didn't have all his faculties uh, uh physically and even mentally i still don't think he would relinquish power i mean i i, I n not willingly i mean maybe he would not will uh, yeah i mean i think he, he would cede cede some responsibilities um to to stephanie uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and as Dan said, you know, for so long, it was Paul uh, Olivec, Triple H. Even that's in question now. Right. I mean, uh, whether because because we saw what became of, of the, uh, the the Wednesday Night Wars a couple of years ago and Triple H maybe losing some confidence um, from Vince McMahon. So, uh, again, I think I think very much the way Vince McMahon will see it until he's gone is, um, you know, I'm the only person who can do this, you know, and and. It's his baby, right? So I, I think it, it, it sort of reminds me of George Lucas and Star Wars. I've been watching a lot of Star Wars uh, lately. And um, at, at some point, you know, he, he sold the company and let it go. But you could see to to today that it, it breaks a little bit of, of his heart every time he sees some <laughs> a Star Wars product that he had nothing to do with. And, and I imagine it would be that way for Vince McMahon uh, as well. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see him ever willingly. And, and and because of that, maybe something like this is the only way short of. And again, this isn't to be, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be fatalistic either, but 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 short of uh, Vince McMahon dying, maybe this is the, the only way that um, they ever turn the page is, is something like this. Um, um, another point, th there's some irony here, right, that for so long, uh, Vince McMahon has wanted to. Uh, brand WWE something other than pro wrestling, family entertainment, together now, forever, whatever, all that stuff. Um, you know, we're 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 closer to uh, whatever uh, 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 Law and Order and, and NCIS than we are to uh, AEW or something like that. And at it, and again, w w this all remains to be seen. But at the end of the day, what may ultimately be his downfall is the most pro wrestling thing right and and <laughs> and in, in in that and and we've heard and i believe very much that that pro wrestling has changed over the last 15 20 years where it isn't as seedy a business uh, as it once was i mean you look at a locker room uh, a wrestling locker room today and you compare it to uh, 15 20 30 years ago th their world's different and and you hear about you know now they're they're playing video games and they're on social media and they're shooting stuff for their instagram uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but Vince McMahon, uh, again, at the end of the day, is very much an old wrestling guy uh, and everything that comes with it. And he's very much a product of that generation where it was kind of the Wild West and boys will be boys and uh, really kind of the, the the most gutter sort of disgusting part. And, and, and I'm not looking to point figures. I'm not even saying he did this, but he certainly comes from that generation. He was, he was in wrestling and he was in an influential role in wrestling. Um, 
when uh, the, the, the dirtiest, seediest things were going on. So I don't know. Is, is there some irony there, Dan, that, again, he, he was ultimately sort of maybe the wrestling part of him is what might be his downfall? Well, I mean, you look at the Dark Side of the Ring series and everything, and, and it, you know, just a cursory viewing of that will show you what the wrestling industry has had in the past. And uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. If you if you go down that road, you'll find a lot of things. But rock and roll, entertainment, you'll find the exact same things, right? Um, so the thing is, Vince is a old school wrestling promoter who, who tried to be something bigger and, and wanted to break out of that traditional wrestling thing that he, he was in. His father was an NWA member and everything else. And he wanted to, to make everything bigger than life and just be a spectacle and, and turn wrestlers into superstars. And, and he did, but he came from an environment where you could have a consensual affair with somebody and pay them hush money. And it's right. no big deal. That's okay in, in the time and in, in era that he came up, but in 2022, in this woke culture with a publicly traded company, yeah. you can't do those things. So his roots are very much pro wrestling and carny roots. And, and what his behavior was, again, we've said it over and over speculative, but it, it's entirely feasible, in, in my opinion, that. He is an old Scott from, from birth. He came up in the wrestling business, you know, military school and everything else, but with his grandfather and father running boxing and wrestling shows, he came up around this business for good or for bad, saw the good, the bad, the ugly. And, and it, it, it's part of his personality. And, you know, just because the business has changed doesn't mean that, uh, somebody who grew up in it has changed with the times. So, yeah, I think it's entirely possible to think that, you know, it's a it's a pro wrestling promoter doing pro wrestling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's sort of the irony of the whole thing. As much as he's he's um, tried to distance himself from pro wrestling, uh, you know, what's more wrestling than this? Um, let, let's take a, a step back and talk sort of more big picture uh, WWE. And, and this is all related because, I mean, timing wise, I mean, I guess there's never a good time for this, but there's so many other things uh, uh, kind of in flux uh, right now. Uh, Brian, we we never got to talk about uh, Cody Rhodes. It's been a few weeks since since we've chatted, and um, we had what what may go down as one of the most memorable WWE, WWE matches um, of the last several years in in Cody and uh, Seth Rollins at Hell in a Cell, and Cody coming out there with a torn peck and and having this match that is sort of like again, sort of the legend of, of Cody Rhodes was was created that night. Not, not that he already was in this huge name and had so much going uh, for him. I mean, really, the, the, I don't know, when's the last time we've seen somebody with this kind of uh, star power, certainly as a baby face in WWE, and he goes on and has that match. And again, it, it, it almost escalates him to uh, mythical status. But the downside that is that he's gone for nine months, uh, apparently. Um, and so everything is sort of thrown for a loop at the same time. You know, it looks like the, the plan was Randy Orton and and uh, Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. That's out the window, uh, apparently, with, with Randy uh, injured. So just a lot of bad timing, and we are back to Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, apparently, uh, at SummerSlam. So um, first, uh, uh, what was your—and now we're a few weeks away, but, but what was your uh, take watching— uh, Cody Rhodes uh, in that match? Oh, you know, a, a few weeks away doesn't even make a difference because I think that, you know, things like this are, are so few and far between, especially now in the business. But, you know, that is a moment that will be a defining moment for him for the rest of his career and life. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you knew it the minute it happened, like the minute he opened his jacket. And I was there with friends watching the show, and I said, he just made himself a legend in, <laughs> in, in this second. Uh, for better or worse, and I know there were people criticizing that and having him come out there injured and all that sort of thing. But for better or worse, and he made himself a legend in that moment. And the question of, which I I had as well, is he going to stay over? Is he going to be a baby face? Is it going to work? Or is the same thing going to happen like what happened in AEW? Are they going to turn on him? He solved that problem. Like I, that is not going to be a problem from him for him. And I think, 
Um, it was a very smart move from that point of view because I think he did it, meaning he made the decision to go out there and work the match in that state. Partly, I think, with that in mind, that if I do this and if I can pull this off and do it, that I will win these people over like nothing before. I think he was very keenly aware of that, and I think he, that was a that was a major factor because and, and it wasn't even just the fact that he came out there like that, that he had the kind of match that he had, that he put in the kind of performance that he put in. And let me tell you, all of that was not selling. I can tell you that. The fact that he did all that, um, it it was a rare and very, very special moment. Um, it, you know, it, it was almost like a WrestleMania moment, not on WrestleMania, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, the, the downside is he's not around to sort of enjoy what, right. what comes out of that, right? I mean, it, it was this, uh, it, it's even more than star making because he was already a star. It really kind of moved them to to that next level. But um, now he's, he's I, I guess, gone uh, nine months is what they're talking. Let's say you, it, it ends up being six. Uh, it That's still a long time um, to be gone and not be able to cash in on, on that uh, uh, momentum. Uh, uh Dan, did, did you watch the match? And and um, did, was it a good idea for him to go out there? I mean, it, again, it, it, as Brian talked about, it is kind of this once in a lifetime moment, but also like, holy crap, what a bad idea to to have a Hell in a Cell match with a torn pack. Well, I did not watch the full match, but I did watch highlights of it. Like I said, I I still follow everything. I'm still always reading about what's going on, but. Uh, I very rarely sit in and, and, and watch from beginning to end. That being said, it was the right move. I think um, for a lot of the reasons Brian had said, he went out there. He Cody, even coming back the way he did at WrestleMania, he was still Cody Rhodes to WWE fans. And I know to wrestling fans, wrestling fans know AEW, but WWE fans know WWE and Cody Rhodes in WWE was mid tier guy who came back. And yes, he came back in a big platform at WrestleMania and he had a win over Seth Rollins and everything else. But, but by virtue of coming out there with that injury and showing the heart he did and winning that match, it took him to another level. Here's the thing though. If WWE allows him to sit and wait nine months or however it is before he's back on TV, you lose a little bit of that. Because fans have a short-term memory, you know, you, you move on to the next thing. WWE does a great job with their video packages, and they can always remind people, but you lose some of that momentum. I think back when uh, Steve Austin got dropped on his on his head by Owen, he was off TV. He couldn't wrestle for a while, but they brought him back, mm -hmm. and they had him in segments. They had him in segments, but no matches, because he... And, it was a different era. It wasn't as widely reported the damage and how significant the broken neck was and, and that it was career threatening and everything at, at the time, but they still brought him back on TV and presented him very, very strongly. If they can find a way to do that for Cody. Now they've already acknowledged the severity of the injury. In fact, if anything, they probably overplayed it to really drive the narrative of the, that match. So it may be a little bit difficult to do this, but if they can find a way to bring Cody back on TV and still present him as strong and a storyline that goes for a little while to build up for something, I think that he's going to be a megastar. My fear is that he, he's got there. He got right to that, that moment. And then every week that goes by where he's not on TV He's dropping a half step, dropping a half step. And I don't know if he'll ever be able to get back to that same peak he was at at Hell in the Cell. The the flip side of that is if you've got him, and I, and I know this isn't what you're saying necessarily, but if you have him on TV regularly every week, whatever, doing commentary or or just cutting promos, maybe it loses some of that that magic. It versus, would. He, yeah. He'd become overexposed unless it's done the right way. You need yeah. a storyline where, where he's out there presented strong. Uh, you can't just have him out there doing, you know, little appearances in back or a guest commentary for the women's tag match. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's gotta be the right storyline and the right appearances. Well, you gotta think there, there is a moment, whatever, six months away, eight, nine months away where Seth Rollins wins some big match and he is celebrating in the ring and, and Cody comes out and beats the crap out of him and the place just absolutely explodes. And you've got a, a huge, you know, the, whatever that would be now, the, the fourth time around, 
that match is bigger than it ever has been, right? Um, when you do it uh, again, or you flip it Seth where something's happening. Something's happening to Seth, and Seth is getting beaten down, and out of nowhere, Cody Rhodes. Comes oh up yeah, Seth sure. Rollins. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God! It, it turned <laughs> the whole thing on its ear. Even more babyface. I mean, that's what Dusty would have done for Nikita or, or Magnum, and I mean, you, there's a lot that could be done that way if you have the right storytelling ahead of time. The, the one thing, uh, uh, Brian, that I wonder if, in, in retrospect, they, they should have done different, and I actually thought this um, the night that it happened, is knowing that Cody was going to be gone a long time, knowing that he was working that match with a torn pack, um, and, and knowing that in the absence of Cody, you know, that's one less star, so you need other guys to to be strong. Why not have had Seth win that match? I think that, you know, th- that's a valid, uh, you know, option. And, and I thought about it when even leading up to it and knowing he was working the match. The first thing I thought was, OK, they're going to have Seth go over here now, I guess, because because, um, you know, Cody's going to be out for a while. I he think he is over as, as I, I, I mean, maybe not as over, but but I think you'd still have that aura of <laughs> holy cow. Look at what Cody just did, even in defeat. I think it would be less, though, I have to say, because I think doing that, if they had done that, that's very that's like classic wrestling booking 101. That's the thing that would usually be done. And I think the fact that it wasn't done made it even more special. It it, it made it like I'm, I came out here and not only am I, oh, I'm this inspirational guy. Yeah, I'm all banged up. Look at me. I'm going to come out and I'm going to give it 110 percent and all that stuff. He actually won the damn match on top of it. Like not only yeah. am I coming out like this, I'm going to win again. You know what I mean? It's that I, I felt like this entire and obviously they had no way of knowing Cody was going to get injured. But I felt like this entire storyline with Rollins and him and him like repeatedly winning and just like the ritual kind of destruction of Seth Rollins. It's been this who, by the way, isn't being hurt by this. It's been a a, a very calculated thing to absolutely bolster up Cody as much as possible to make sure that um, the fans don't turn on him. I think that they're having him work with Rollins, who is really good at that. He is not somebody that the fans are going to side with. I mean, he, they're just not. So you, you know what I mean? It's it, He's not the cool heel. So I, I think this, even though it was unexpected, the injury and everything, it became part of that whole process of we are going to do everything we could humanly do to make sure that Cody becomes the number one baby face in this company like we need him to be. And so I think it was the right move having him win the match. It it, it um, still makes me maybe more now sort of wonder what the trajectory is uh, here. You know, at, at one point, I remember we were talking about whether they go with Cody and Roman at SummerSlam. Yeah. And uh, it's clear that that wasn't the plan even before uh, Cody was hurt. Um, and it it also seems that, that they, they very much are planning for and we'll see if it comes together. Uh, but but Roman Reigns and, and The Rock at WrestleMania. Uh, so when do they do this? I mean, are, are they thinking two years out? Are they thinking WrestleMania 40? And and um, do they really have the patience to to wait until then to, to coronate Cody? Well, I think there's two possibilities here. And we've actually talked about one, which is that they could he could potentially meaning Roman could potentially lose the title to Cody Rhodes before WrestleMania. And then what you've got is Roman Reigns versus The Rock at WrestleMania, which is so big it doesn't even need the title. Like it's incredibly big. And and it also leaves the door open for potentially, although I don't think he should, but for potentially The Rock even winning, or at least speculation that he might win. Fans might think there's more of a chance if there is no title at stake. And you can also have on top of that at WrestleMania, Cody Rhodes, your top baby face defending the title against some worthy opponent of some kind. And, Seth and it, Rollins. Yeah, maybe. Well, I don't know. I mean, how many times could they wrestle? But somebody, somebody, maybe Brock, who knows? I mean, yeah. that could be an interesting match with him, you know, the David and Goliath thing. But it could be that, or it could be what you're saying, which is like they are really and truly playing the long game with Roman Reigns, and they see him getting all the way to WrestleMania as champion and past WrestleMania as champion and and at some point, I don't know about WrestleMania 40 for Cody, but at some point after WrestleMania 39, maybe putting it on him. 
Yeah, yeah. Dan, I mean, it, it's almost laughable. Here we are. You, you've been away now for, for three years, and we're talking about kind of the state of WWE, and we're talking about Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton, and I think John Cena's on Raw tonight. As we're <laughs> yeah. talking, I think John Cena's on Raw. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, n- not not being as close a watcher uh, as, as uh, uh, you were years ago, what's sort of your take on, on kind of the state of, of WWE? Is it disheartening uh, that it is the same old faces and we haven't seen that much elevation or, um, you know, you look at a guy like Cody who, who really wasn't in the mix uh, of years ago and, and, and very much is a top guy uh, now. And, and is that, you know, reason for, for some optimism? No, nostalgia and, 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 you know, you have the rose uh, colored glasses looking back, but I remember when I was a kid and, and got into watching wrestling and even through the glory days and, you know, let's say from 84 up and through 98, 99, up in 2005, 2006, maybe, um, you could look at a wrestling show, a match or two. You could see a clip, see it on YouTube. And I can look at the wrestlers in a clip and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's uh, Terry Gordy. And I saw it earlier today. Terry Gordy shoved a fan. It's it's a, a thing in world class. Oh yeah, that's world class. It's 1983, mm-hmm. maybe 84. Terry Gordy, you know, red gear, whatever. I can look at the WWF clips. Oh, okay, Ted RCD. That would have been 86. This would have been here. This would have been here. The thing that WWE over the past 10 years or so has been, you can look at it pretty much at any point, and it all blurs together. Yeah, you're it's absolutely right. The same <laughs> yep. names. It's the same people wrestling. The only thing that broke it up was the Thunderdome stupid gimmick, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, so it's okay, that looks different. You're and then, right. So now last night or the other night when Vince McMahon came on, I, I told my fiance, hey, I, I know this is silly, but I want to put on wrestling for a minute. Uh, Vince McMahon is going to speak and whatever. So, okay, it's, it's fine. So I put it on. Um, it begins with the whole intro package. And uh, Vince comes out and says nothing and, and leaves. And she's like, so that's why you wanted to watch? I'm like, well, yeah, he, he came. Like, I wanted to hear what he would say, whatever. But now I want to see, okay, what are they going to do with that first quarter hour? Who comes out after Vince? Big spike on, on SmackDown, everything else. It's Riddle. And Riddle comes out with the graphic of the snake. And here comes out the guy on the, 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 the you know, little scooter. And then he jumps in and he clicks his heels and it's furry rabbits that shoot out. Okay. And she's like, what the frig are we watching? What is it? I'm like, I, and the thing is, I can't even explain it to her because I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it got to this stage. Anyway, <laughs> the point being is other than those little goofy things and the crazy camera cuts that make it so painful to watch, especially raw, um, we're just, Shot, 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 cut, 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 cut. Other than those little uh, style things, you can tune in and you can see uh, Randy Orton or Coffee Kingston or a Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns or whatever, or the Usos or against. It, it looks the exact same as it did seven years ago, yeah. six years ago. And that sucks for the growth of the product. <laughs> you, 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 you need to have something that, that connects, that bites. Uh, guys get over and then when they're not over, they get released and they get let go. Nobody wants to see anyone get released. But the point is you have to have a churning of fresh talent. And when it's just the same faces all the time, why bother? I feel like I haven't watched raw an episode in three, four years. And I don't feel like I've missed it at all because if I tune in and watch it this Monday night, it's going to be the exact same damn guys, you know, except Ezekiel is or Elias is Ezekiel and Ezekiel is Elias. What? That's the only difference. That's well, revelation. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Yeah, yeah, that's depressing, Dad. But but you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, like I I, I could pop in an, an old VHS tape uh, or something and uh, from the 80s and 90s and um and and you know you pop it in and and you could literally like pinpoint almost to the month right of what you're watching like oh this had to be. July 1994 um, from who's on top and what the look of the show is and the intro and the sets and who's on commentary. And um, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you you literally could have put on a raw from 10 years ago and you're going to see basically the, the exact same show 
um and, and maybe somebody uh michael cole's got a different uh, broadcast partner but 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 yeah very very little um uh, changes it, it it really is like it, this glacial pace that that wv is on yeah the change i you know i i i think about this sometimes too for the very reason that you say how i can watch an old show and tell you when it is pretty pretty precisely i think it's uh, you know it is changing. Here's the thing for me, like there's change. And I don't even just mean in the talent, even in just the, 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 the look and the set design, but here's the thing the, the it is a much slower and gradual change that, than there used to be like, um, you know, you, it used to be that from year to year, you, you know, there was such a clear shift in the talent roster, in the look, in the production, there were new things happening. And there's definitely a stagnation going on where, you know, um, there's there's a large portion of the roster that was there 10 years ago that is there now. Yeah. And stuff like that never really used to happen. You know, there. Um, I remember at WrestleMania 9 that thinking it was such a big deal that Tito Santana um, had been at every WrestleMania except, you know, him and Hulk Hogan were like the only ones that had wrestled at every WrestleMania. And that was only a, an eight year span. And that was like, oh my God, wow, that's an incredible feat. Now you've got guys that, you know, have Randy Orton's been in like 47 Royal Rumbles. And, you know, <laughs> guys yeah. have been there forever. They were, you know, Kane eliminated like 8,000 people from the Royal Rumble. This guy's had like 27 WrestleMania matches because there's far less um, turnover and just everything just changes much more slowly and gradually. Now, you can't pinpoint the era as precisely as you used to be able to do. Certainly not. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Randy Orton is is a great example of this um, because it's not like he's a, a nostalgia act, right? He he's just, you know, you look at at SummerSlam, uh, not quite twenty years ago, but but I, I guess he was already in the company twenty years ago. I don't know, he was. I don't know, if, he, I don't know if he wrestled on SummerSlam two thousand two. That was the one out here in uh, NASA Coliseum. But but two thousand four, he won the world title. He was in the main event of, of SummerSlam. And now, uh, 18 years later, uh, and it didn't end up happening because he's injured. But but he was pegged to be in in the main event of SummerSlam, uh, 2024. And again, not as a, a a nostalgia act, just as kind of like the latest contender. Um, and and it again, it it speaks to like yeah, that thing, things really haven't changed very much. He is still, and it's also a testament to the guy being a great performer and still relatively young, uh, and in great shape. Uh, but y- you know, I used to always, uh, at the end of WrestleMania, sort of like to predict, I wonder what main event of, of WrestleMania next year uh, will be. And you think like, well, imagine if they, ele- you know, maybe by then they'll elevate this guy from the mid card up until uh, up to the, the main event spot. And and realistically, you know, if you're a betting man, regardless of what year we're in for the next several years, just bet on Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. Because that's, <laughs> that's pro- you know, it's, it's a good a chance as anything to be the main event uh, of a pay-per-view and it's, and it's about to be the, the main event of, of, uh, of another pay-per-view uh, as kind of going full circle. It does make you wonder if Vince McMahon uh, and, and whether it's now or five years from now, um, whether it changes almost overnight once he's out of uh, of power and, and there are other people at the helm, whether we, we do see radical change uh, relatively quickly, you know, and, and we've gotten hints of it, when Triple H was running NXT, and you saw that he really did have a different vision. I mean, he wanted to make it clear that, um, you know, I, I my wrestling is not Vince McMahon's wrestling, uh, but we see how that, that worked out for Triple H and how that worked out for, for NXT. Um, but, but before we run, uh, uh, um, to, to change subject a little bit, because we, we don't have Dan on a lot. Dan, when, when you were last around, AEW was months in. I mean, I don't even know if they had their first show. I remember... Us talking about the, uh, the the PWI 500 that year, um, and I think AEW only had one show. And 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 the big discussion I remember now is whether to give AEW world title status. Uh, I think before they even had a show, and and uh, if if I recall, you were not super fond of that uh, idea. Um, and now we are, I guess, three years in, just about to to AEW's run. 
And, um, you know, a, a quick sort of state of AEW since we last, last talked, Brian, CM Punk is the world champion and then kind of not the world champion because he he uh, broke his foot or something. So now they're going to crown an interim world champion. Um, we've got the craziness with MJF and then kind of trying to uh, uh, do Brian Pillman all over again in 2022. Uh, uh, Dan, what's been your and I know how close you're watching, but but what's your impression of uh, AEW in 2022? AEW is making it interesting, at least. Um, they, they are, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, a little less regimented than WWE. It's not as corporate and stylized. Uh, there's like early impact or some ECW, some, uh, just kind of like passion here and there. Like, and it might go off the rails. It might be a terrible segment. It might be whatever, but it, at least it's different. At least it, it's got some kind of passion and heart behind it. Um, the MJF segment, I, I, I thought right away it was a work. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but you know, it's, you know, the, the, the further, the longer you follow wrestling, you begin to think everything's a work. <laughs> you know, again, somebody mentioned, Brian, you mentioned the tinfoil hat thing, and maybe that's something too, where, you know, you, you follow it too long and all of a sudden you're, you're Kane, you know, tweeting weird things about, uh, whatever you believe, whatever conspiracy <laughs> comes along. So you, you can work yourself into a shoot, I guess. But uh, it, it seemed like me it, to me it was a work, and that's good because it got people talking, and it got people talking about MJF, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, the CM Punk stuff, it, it's he, he won the title. It's a great story arc. The injury sucks because it, again, it ruins all momentum, especially with this Forbidden Door pay per view coming up and everything else. It just seems like right now it feels like the company's floundering and trying to do an interim champion just seems like it's just, I don't know. It's going to water things down to the point where you have the inevitable uh, ladder match for the two titles or the unification match, whatever. And it just seems redundant because CM Punk had his own storylines going on. He didn't need this kind of thing, but it, it's fun to watch because they're at least changing things up and, and trying some different things. Whereas WWE as as we've discussed is doing the same stuff that they've done since 2013, you know? So it's good to have somebody out there pressing boundaries and, and trying something different. Yeah, Brian, it's been a while since we've talked uh, AEW and, and uh, Double or Nothing was one of their biggest shows of the year. And as we touched on, uh, CM Punk wins the world title. And then I guess the, the big headline coming out was uh, MJF. But um, I, you know, some of this is a product, I guess, of sort of the ebbs and flows. Who, who's got on any given week the, the bigger headline? But uh, I'd be lying if I said I was, like, super excited about um, this Forbidden Door pay-per-view. We've talked a little bit about um, how Tony Khan's got to be careful over hyping some of these announcements. And this is the last announcement he made. And it could have been a big deal. But then you look at the card, and this is not exactly like the 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 dream card of all dream cards, right? When you've got uh, Will Austin and Orange Cassidy. Um, so... Uh, you know, it, it does feel like th th they've also been the victim of maybe some bad timing in between, you know, th their biggest star, one of the biggest stars in wrestling, winning the, t the world title and then going down almost immediately with, with a foot injury. And the MJF stuff, I, you know, ugh, I, I think it rubs some people the wrong way. I'm never a huge fan of, of these kind of work shoot stuff. Um, so... It's all to say that that everything that's happened in AEW kind of post double or nothing, I I don't know that it has um, increased my interest in AEW. You know, uh, I I've been noticing a lot of people saying things like that, even more than I've been noticing the product appreciably getting worse. To be honest, and it's not because I haven't noticed that because I have, but. Not, I think there's a little bit of an overreaction going on. And I don't know if it's because they set the bar really high or they set the standard really high. Um, you know, I, they they do feel like it does feel like it's it's sort of like a mini valley going on. But but I don't. But you're still talking about a company with a lot of forward momentum that's always, as Tony Khan will incessantly remind everybody, doing better numbers year over year and week over week and show over show and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're doing well, but you know you got to remember when you're when you're faced with WWE, you want to talk about the long game. I mean, that's the ultimate long game, and you can't get too caught up 
in trying to beat them at everything and all this sort of thing and and coming on TV and you know kind of marking out and all this stuff you have to focus on making your product the best that it can be i still think that and maybe this is just a damning condemnation of WWE but i still excuse me i still think that AEW Dynamite is the most watchable enjoyable wrestling show every week uh, um so i mean i'm not i'm not that terribly concerned i do think this injury stuff is alarming and i mean it's not just AEW but it seems to be um mainly AEW i mean you've got now they're saying daniel bryan may not be ready for um for forbidden door cm punk's getting you know has been pulled obviously for surgery from forbidden door everything getting shaken up this absolutely i'm sorry absolutely pointless interim championship thing which i guess yeah. they've stolen from boxing and mma and it's pointless there too it's like look you either strip the champion or and and crown a new champion or you let them hold the title and you put the title on ice for a few months till they get better you can't have your cake and eat it too because an interim title means nothing what are you the champion of you, you have a champion so i mean all this kind of stuff you know is hurting them in the moment but i think it i i think it's just the moment i, I don't see them i mean i mean i still think that they are in good shape yeah, I agree. I, I'm not at all kind of like a predicting their doom or anything. Um, I, I just think it, in some ways it's been a rough few weeks. A and the injury thing, it really is fascinating. And, and even outside of, of AEW, I mean, when you think about in AEW, um, CM Punk, and, and, I, and I don't know who else I'm, I'm forgetting, in WWE, Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes, NWA lost its its world champion days before a, a pay-per-view named after him. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's just a bad coincidence. I don't know if there's some bigger takeaway about the style or something. Uh, I don't think there is. I mean, I don't think much has changed. It's just uh, sort of bad timing, uh, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 um, I, I still think AEW is, is it. I still think it's a, a hell of a product and uh, a rough few weeks. Everybody's entitled to it. And, and look, AEW at their worst is, is better than, than most companies at their best. As far as Forbidden Door, this was always kind of a tricky thing, right? And and um, even historical, maybe you guys have some 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 better examples. But when you have an intrapromotional show, uh, as exciting as it is on paper, the reality is that politics get in the way, right? And so you can't yeah, they, have a top guy always, versus a top uh, guy, you know, they, they because always, somebody's got to lose. Yeah, the, the interpromotional shows never live up to expectations. Uh, from Worlds Collide into all of the old uh, WWF versus NWA, NWA, AWA World Championship matches. It's always the, the Schmaus finish, double count out, double DQ, whatever. It's always, but the thing is, it doesn't matter what the show is because it's all the anticipation. And especially <clears throat> in the pre internet era, right? where people aren't going over spoilers or who's going to win. Just the, the idea that something captured the imagination because it was different and new and you, you'll probably never see it again. That was enough to make people buy. And as long as there's a couple good matches on the show, people would be satisfied with it. And 2022 though, it's just, we've seen so much. We've gone so far. It's really hard to think, Oh, Tanahashi's going to be on a show. Okay. Or whoever, but there's no stakes. It doesn't matter. So it, it feels anticlimactic. Uh, yeah. It's just not what a uh, you know interpromotional show would have been mystique wise in the past. Yeah, yeah, I, I think Brian touched on it, but but one thing I think that they could have and still could do, I guess, uh, to to really make it feel more special is put the world title on the line. You know, let CM Punk and wrestle for it when he gets back. Um, but but uh, and I think is the match Tanahashi and uh, Moxley. Uh, uh, make that for the AEW World Championship, and maybe put it on on Tanahashi. I mean that that would be uh, very very exciting. That they could create a lot of buzz, and then you would have uh, that match set up, Punk and Tanahashi, when when Punk is ready to come back, and and that would be huge um, for the world title. So uh, yeah, this interim stuff is a bad look. Dana White loves to do it um, whenever he's got some spat with a, a world uh, champion. He just creates another one, um, and uh, it, it's. Yeah, it's just annoying. Uh, all right. I, what, I guess I, I've got like a pile of things, uh, oh, but in terms of, of timeliness, um, and I know, again, both you guys being a historians, it's worth mentioning, uh, bringing up with both of you. We lost two legendary referees in, in the last week in uh, both Dave Habner and, and Tim White that, that unfortunately died uh, w within days of each other. 
Uh, uh, Brian, and anything you'd say about but either of those guys, their their legacies in, in wrestling, and and maybe does it speak to sort of the the forgotten art form of, of refereeing, where by and large, certainly in WWE now, um, th- they're just nameless officials. They don't even want you to know their names. Mm-hmm. But both uh, Dave Hebner and and Tim White uh, came from a, a different era where you where they very much were personalities and and never overstepped. Um, right? I mean, there was the memorable Dave Hebner, Earl Hebner uh, mm-hmm. angle, but 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 by and large, they kind of stayed in their lane. But um, it, it did have uh, kind of a relationship with fans that you don't see, at least in WWE. I think I think in other companies and even AEW uh, with with Audrey, you, you see it there. But but um, uh, what what can you tell us about uh, Tim White and uh, uh, Dave Hebner? Well, you know it, what you're talking about is is mainly a WWE thing and mainly a modern WWE thing with the ana- anonymity of referees and you know it, it, it's um, and it wasn't like that before. I mean, it, you're right. I mean, everybody knew the names of the top WWE referees, and there was a time. You know, everybody talks about Earl Hebner, be, and, and he kind of took over um, in in late '88 when Dave uh, was having knee issues, as a lot of referees do. But Dave Hebner, for a few years there, Dave Hebner was the most visible WWF referee. I would say 86, 87, 88. He refereed the Ricky Steamboat, Randy Savage um, uh, Intercontinental title match at WrestleMania. I mean, you know, he he was the guy. And and I also want to point out, because there was some confusion online not to besmirch the memory of Dave Hebner, that Dave Hebner was the good referee in the twin right. referee uh, thing. Earl Hebner was the evil paid mm-hmm. off referee, not the other way around. But Earl got the plastic surgery. Right, exactly. But <laughs> coincidentally, it turned out that because of Dave's, you know, kind of nagging injuries and needing to step away, and he wound up becoming a producer, a backstage agent, that Earl, you know, became the visible referee and, and kind of went on to probably a, a, a more a long and even more accomplished career as a ref. But Dave was even known behind the scenes. I remember when I worked there, he was one of the guys, he would always do the payoffs to the wrestlers backstage, which meant that he was very popular, like handing out literal cash to everybody. You know, that'll make you very popular. Um, and he, he was he was a beloved figure in the company for sure. And Tim White, even more so than that, because what a lot of people need to understand is even before he was a referee, Tim White's role in the company was he was the handler of Andre the Giant. And this was like a sacred position because Andre the Giant, as people know, was booked out of the WWF office, even going back to the mid 70s um, to all the different territories. It was Vince McMahon Sr. was kind of his booking agent. And so it was very important to have a handler who would go on the road with Andre, make sure he was taken care of, make sure he had all of his needs met, and you know, because obviously his size issues and things, and just keep him sober and just everything else that needed to be done. And originally that was a guy, I believe the original guy was a guy named Frankie Valois, who came from, uh, who was a, a Quebecois wrestler who was, originally hooked up with Andre when he was making his name up there, but then it became Arnold Skoland in the WWF and Arnold Skoland was doing that for years. You know, Arnold Skoland had this real true actual managerial duty for Andre. And then it, when, when Arnie retired in 85, pretty much it became Tim white and, and Tim did that for pretty much solely well he he refereed part time but he was mainly Andre's handler until Andre's passing when Andre died in 90 in the early 90s then Tim became a full time ref and and that's where he really became in the 90s in that era he was one of WWE's main referees and I, I think probably the most high profile match for him would have to be the hell in the cell with Mick Foley and, and Undertaker, you know, he was the ref for that at the King of the Ring. And, you know, there's the story of, of, of Tim White, like legitimately wanting to end the match and fearing for Mick's life and well-being. And, and Foley is begging him not to and, and to let it go on. And he knows what he's doing and all that kind of thing. You know, that's that may have been his most famous moment as a referee. But I mean, both guys. Like you said, 
from a from a bygone era where where referees were really recognized, um, especially in WWE, um, you, you you still get it now in other companies. But you know, it makes a difference because WWE is the leader in the industry, and if they're not doing it, if the re- the referees aren't even mentioned on television by name, um, you know, then it, that's not going to really happen with contemporary referees where they become these beloved figures and characters we all remember and love. People like you know Dick Worley and Dick Kroll and 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 Red Shoes. Dugan and God, who was the guy in in Texas? Oh my God, Dan could probably help me with this. He was uh, in world Lubitsch. class. Yes, Bronco Lubitsch, Bronco right? Lubitsch. I mean, there were guy re, legendary referees. Even the idea of that is is almost like an anachronism. But so those two guys were throwbacks and and really beloved in the company for sure. Yeah, it's amazing how you could just rattle off the name of, of this many referees from the eighties and nineties. And, and I can think of many more, right? You think of uh, Joey Morella and Tommy, um, Young. Tommy Young. Sure. Even, even Mike Kyoto, who was around for uh, up until a, a few years ago. And I thought that was uh, such a, I, I don't know what the reasons for it, but, but more than most firings um, that one really rubbed me the wrong way when they let Mike Kyoto go, because yeah. um, he, he went back to the 1980s. I mean, he, he was, and, and as we've seen, since uh, AEW's brought him in a couple of times, he absolutely could still go um, in, in terms of, of of doing what you need to do uh, at, at, in his part as a referee. Uh, and it's it, I could I literally I don't think I could name you one WWE referee right now. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you something about Kyoto though, and AEW using him because here's one thing I will say in favor of WWE with referees. Now, they they don't allow any of them to get over, but. They trained them very, very well, and they still do, especially compared to the AEW referees. And they, they've they always had that track record of really hammering it into the referees that you have to assert yourself as the person in charge in the match. Even if the re- the, the wrestlers are getting heat by ignoring you and flouting your authority, the point is you have to show your authority. And when, when they used Mike Chioda at uh, Double or Nothing, let me tell you something. He stood out from everyone on that show. And I said it while I was watching it because the AEW referees, look, there's no way to sugarcoat this. They're terrible. They're just (laughs) terrible. There's no way to say this nicely. And you know what? Okay, it's not their fault. They're being told to work a certain way or whatever. Instead of being an authority figure, they act like the beleaguered parent, uh, the overwhelmed parent of a three-year-old toddler that's just desperately trying to maintain control of a situation instead of being like, you know, I'm the boss. And when Kyoto was in there, and I forget what match he had, man, it was night and day watching him just get in there and, and be a ref, you know? I mean, there's something to be said for that. WWE does know how to train referees. Would you say that goes for Aubrey Edwards too? Do you, do you put her in the category of uh, uh, these beleaguered referees? <laughs> Are you trying to make me just? <laughs> All right, we'll move on. You're trying to get in trouble here. I, I I'm not mentioning names. I will say this: she's not the worst. Not by a long shot is she the worst. She's not even the second worst. But it's just it's a problem over there for sure. Yeah, yeah, and 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 for what's worth, uh, uh, we saw both Earl. And uh, who's the kid? Uh, Hebner's uh, uh, Brian. Brian Hebner uh, on um, Slimeversary uh, last night, which is actually a really good show. And uh, they had a nice tribute at the end of the match. They were looking up at at, uh, at Dave and and a nice moment. Um, so and and uh, yeah, wrap it up here. I don't want to talk too much about this, but um, I got to mention. I think Josh Alexander is fantastic. I don't, uh, uh, Dan, uh, uh, I, I guess he might have uh, some. Well, he's from Canada, but but that's up near you, right? So. Uh, did you see a lot of Josh Alexander before he came to Impact? A little bit, yeah. And, and I know his wife, uh, Jade Chung, uh, really well. I've known her going way back. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, and once they started dating, she kind of, uh, we were hanging out in Toronto, and she goes, I want to tell you something. I just started dating a wrestler, but I don't want anyone <laughs> to know. And, and and wouldn't tell me his name at first. I had to kind of figure it out. Um and they're an amazing couple. Like they're really good and they're kids and everything. And she's, a, and I only bring her up because she appears on TV occasionally. She, she was there last her, night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she's part of storylines and everything too. Uh, but man, he's, he's uh, a heck of a talent and yeah. uh, they, they have, uh, she's fantastic. Like I said, I've been friends with her since uh, 2005, 2006, I think. So uh, yeah, she's uh, she's great, and uh, it, it's really cool that he's made it uh, up as high as he has. 
<laughs> Especially it, 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 given the injuries he's had prior. Oh, know, yeah. I mean, coming back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's another uh, interview we've had here in the podcast that, uh, leading into uh, Balfour Glory last year. I got to talk to him and, and really liked him. And he was working a construction job until uh, about a year ago and, and doing this uh, part time. And, you know, it, it it's hard to sort of like pinpoint exactly what it is. But, but you know, um, really quality world title main event wrestling when you see it and josh alexander has it i mean now i was um uh, in poughkeepsie for his match with moose when he won the world title and last night with eric young and it really is on a different level than every other thing else they're doing uh on impact and that's not a slight i thought there was a lot good on the show last night and, and for uh, me i would say crap cost that, that nobody else has yeah th- that's the consummate trademark or hallmark of a wrestler's wrestler you know yes. to go back to the, the mention of the book i, I think that josh alexander uh, it would certainly be a, a wrestler's wrestler, a guy who just has the the presence and the technical aspect and all of the the little things that just when he goes out there and he's got the right opponent in the right stage, he he outshines everything around him. Even though he's kind of underrated, he's not the kind of guy that you, you know. Here we are. We've been talking about wrestling for ninety minutes now on this podcast, and his name comes up now. We've talked right. about Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns and everything else. He comes in at the very end because he's not, you know, uh, top of the mind. But when he does come up, he's one of those guys who's like, yeah, universally, people are like, he's he's got the stuff. He's a good, he's a great wrestler. Yeah, and I and I think that kind of speaks to where Impact uh, is these days. And and uh, I, I didn't plan on talking about it a lot, but but they did just turn twenty years old, right? I mean, this is uh, the twentieth um, anniversary, and uh, last night being Slam anniversary, they were celebrating that. And I think they did a really nice job of kind of balancing the old and new in, in, in that way. That main event was sort of perfect. Josh Alexander representing kind of the the, the new Impact, the new generation, working with Eric Young, who's got his roots in, in kind of the old uh, TNA. And that was sprinkled uh, throughout the show. We saw D'Lo Brown. We saw Gail Kim. We saw AJ Styles kind of promo. Um, so uh, a really fun show, uh, I got to say. And and um, it's good. I'm, I'm glad Impact had their night. Um, all right, guys, we, we have been talking for, for 90 minutes. And uh, Dan, you in particular, I, I, I don't want to let you go <laughs> uh, because it, it is so good to, to have you back uh but thanks for coming back and uh maybe i guess uh episode 300 we'll have you back on but is there anything you you, you want to uh, uh promote anything you want to mention before we let you go well first of all i am putting that in my calendar so <laughs> 300 yes. I, I will be here um <clears throat> no other than you know I, I snuck in a couple uh mentions in my book and that's great uh and the other thing i'd like to promote if if anything is the cauliflower alley club I uh, recently became a member of the advisory board just a, a earlier this week um, but I've been involved with, uh, the CAC, been attending events for about 11, 12 years now, uh, for anyone who, who's not familiar. And, and I know Brian, has, it came out last year, um, Cauliflower Alley Club is a great reunion for pro wrestlers and anyone in the wrestling industry as well as fans, but it's a great, um, fraternal organization and it raises money for wrestlers in need. Uh, so it's a great, uh, organization to support especially as fans, the money goes back to wrestlers who, uh, have health problems, have other financial difficulties. Uh, Paul, Mr. Wonderful Orndorff, Kamala, others over the past few years have really benefited from, uh, the CAC and it's, it's kind of outreach program. So, you know, uh, any fan interested, you know, check out cauliflower rally club, uh, org online and, uh, check it out. I'd love you to come out to Vegas for the reunion, but, Anything you can to support CAC, I think, is a, a worthwhile and uh, commendable thing. Excellent. Yeah, I definitely got to get out there one day. Uh, and, and Brian, we know your book is now uh, certainly available on Amazon, anywhere else. And uh, you got the podcast. I listened to uh, you and Kevin. That was a really fun episode. Uh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. you guys uh, talk at all things uh, Peter Bay. That was fun. Uh, so so uh, uh, tell people about your book and where they can get it. Sure. So my book is Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real life story of wrestling's original Sheik. It's the first biography of the original Sheik, Ed Farhat. And right now it's really available everywhere. I mean, Amazon's the main place people are getting it, but also Barnes and Noble. Uh, I've seen it in a couple of brick and mortar bookstores and, um, you know, it's it's available in print form, in digital form and even in audiobook form, which I, I also had the privilege of 
of narrating that myself. So that was fun. So that's Very out nice. there. And, and I've nice. even, yeah, uh, that was, I, I was glad they let me do that. Cause I, I just thought, well, there's so many, there's so much in this book that could go wrong if somebody doesn't know the story. So I'm glad they let me do it. But, uh, and there's also my own podcast now, uh, uh, you mentioned it, Shut Up and Wrestle, which um, I've been doing since February and it's an old school wrestling podcast. So um, I don't talk about current wrestling on there because you know i mean like there's so many people that do that and they do it well so this is about the old school and i, I recently had baby doll as a guest i've had the blue meanie as a guest uh rob van dam of course from pwi i had Stu on Stu sacks i had kevin i had reg on i'm gonna get to you too alex just we <laughs> talk to each other every single week and every single you know, like, like like how much could we talk to each other no i'm kidding but we, no we will we, we will do that soon but i'm gonna have um uh oh god actually craig i got craig peters too so oh, that's really, great craig is I'm a running i'm talk. running out of pwi legends but yeah a uh, bill bill is like getting him is, is like trying to get i think like like the loch ness monster to come <laughs> on. i'm gonna i'm gonna eventually nail him down it's gonna happen bill after but that that shows a lot of fun it's part of the arcadian vanguard network which has the cornet shows so i mean i've been like blessed because there's a lot of visibility for for the you know that whole like network of shows that I wouldn't have had if I just started from scratch. So uh, that's, you know, people can find it wherever they get podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you go, it'll be there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys. This was a, a real pleasure. And again, thanks for for the last 200 episodes. Uh, uh, lucky to be uh, able to work with you both. Uh, everybody else, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, check out the latest issue of uh, PWI over at pwi-online.com and we'll be back. Mm-hmm.